Right, we're live. Okay. Welcome back, everybody. It's good to see you all again. And Shannon, and we're glad that Jonah is seems to be doing well. So praise God. Absolutely. Yes, it was uh, Marie who asked at the close of Malcolm's message last night. Marie behind my wife, Marie. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> you have to call, start calling me something else. <laughs> yeah. So, yes, yeah, so we're, we're really grateful for that. And, uh, yeah, it's good to see you, Julie. Wonderful to have you with us. So we're going to begin with a word of prayer, and uh, then I'll share uh, my an aspect of my testimony and some principles uh, that um, I pray will be a blessing for us. Okay. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this privilege that we have to bask in the sunshine of your love, and we thank you for the physical sunshine that is, it's a symbol, Father, and it's, uh, it's a channel and a reminder that as in the physical, so in the spiritual. And I pray now that as we share together and as I share aspects of my testimony and we look at some biblical principles, I pray that you would give me the words to speak, that they would be what we need to hear, Father, that would glorify you and that our hearts and minds would be open to the impressions of your spirit Amen. upon our hearts. Guide us and lead us now into all truth. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay. Yes, yes. Enjoy the sunshine. My voice can project a bit, so you guys should be able to hear me no problem. Cool. So I want to I want to begin this by kind of bringing us up to speed or reminding us of some of the things that we are have left behind this week, the cares of the world. Just just to give us some context for where we're at in in history and in time and some of the the real dangers that we're faced with. I think we're all aware that you know right now we're on the edge of a third world war and it could come through, I mean, two obvious scenarios that we're aware of. Uh, and there could be many others. I mean, we have the ongoing war between Russia and Ukraine, which is really kind of a proxy war. Ukraine is the proxy for the United States through NATO. And we are on the edge of what looks like unless again unless the spirit of god intervenes would easily could become a third world war because uh, we know that ukraine and nato have publicly stated their intentions as has the secretary of state anthony blinken from the united states has said ukraine's going into nato they are going to become a nato member and this was a red line since the 90s and since the the wall came down in germany uh, and the Soviet Union collapsed, there have been promises made from our leaders and our diplomats saying that we will not move NATO, which is a defensive alliance, okay, that's its whole purpose, we won't move it any further to the east. But yet, over these last, well, about 30 years, we've moved it over a thousand miles to the east, and now we have uh, missiles that are capable to be equipped with nuclear warheads that are within minutes of Moscow. And that's, you guys remember, I mean, a, a number of us weren't alive then, including myself, but during the Cuban Missile Crisis, we were about ready to go to war because we thought that there were nuclear missiles that were there in Cuba and that they could launch those right in our backyard. So can you understand and empathize with Putin and Russia? And the whole principle of war obviously isn't Christ-like at all. These, these principles, we don't find these in the kingdom of God. And so we, we have that scenario. And of course, we've seen what's happened since October, I believe it was October 7th in the Middle East. You know, we have the escalating tensions between Palestine and particularly Hamas and the terrorist organizations in Israel. And we see that that's polarizing everybody in the world and especially in this country as well. And it's really now with Iran having retaliated from what Israel had done, taking out some of their leaders of state in Syria, they launched missiles that just a few weeks back, some of them actually weren't able to, most of them were intercepted, but some 
landed in Israel, and that could easily spark us into a third world war. And then on top of all those things, of course, we have in our country, just our country and in the West in general, we have this increasing polarization culturally. And we can see, I mean, we feel it. We have these two opposing sides, this oppositional forces that are clashing, and we see an identity crisis uh, with, like, who, what, what makes us men and women? We don't even know how to define that physically anymore. Uh, and this isn't even talking about the spiritual identity crisis that we have. But on top of that, we also have this, this side that is fomenting or fanning the flames of this identity crisis to destabilize us. And they're promoting, or actually, they're giving us, mask. it's masquerading as liberty. We're liberating the individuals, liberating women. We're giving, you know, sexual liberation, all these things. It's masquerading as more liberty to people, but really it's a license for selfishness. And it's a license for vice and licentiousness. And it's destroying families. It's destabilizing this country. And this is very intentional. Satan is obviously instigating that while simultaneously instigating the response which is the rise of christian conservatism in this country and that is what ultimately will bring a theocracy again just as we know in the book of revelation especially particularly in revelation 13 it's showing us history will repeat in the early days of the fledgling church after the days of the apostles Within a few centuries, we had, by the 4th century, we had a complete union where the leaders of the Christian church, they used the state to impose their ideas, to legislate Christianity, to attempt to make the Roman Empire more moral. And this is exactly what is going to happen again. History is repeating itself. And so... We're seeing the stimulus right now in this left response, wokeism, extreme liberalism, which is destabilizing everything to where we don't even, today everything seems to be offensive to everybody. And we see this increasing amount of censorships that, that's happening. And this is, again, awakening this sleeping giant that has always been here in his actually plagued the this country and the principles of this republic since its inception because it, for anybody who studied the history of the founding of america we had these two opposing forces being this idea of a land where you can truly have liberty liberty of conscience okay to worship god or not not worship god as you see fit and also to have in turn civil liberty we had only it's only ever been a small minority of people that especially when the, the people first came from Europe seeking religious liberty, when they left Europe, the majority of people wanted to do the same thing that had been done earlier by the Catholic Church, which is establish a theocracy. Mm -hmm. To enforce morality, enforce Christianity through the use of the state. And this, these concepts were seen in the efforts of the pilgrims and the Puritans. And there was actually only a handful of people one name in particular, a man named Roger Williams, who God used, who understood something about God's character and about the kingdom of heaven that few people did. He was over 150 years ahead of his time. It was the principles that he used to charter the colony of Rhode Island that in large part influenced the United States Constitution. And so that's happening simultaneously while we see this destabilization in the world and this rising of aggression where leaders of nations are becoming increasingly angry. And of course, behind all of these things, it's what I've already touched on. It's an attack on these, the principles that this nation is built upon. First, it's an attack on our civil liberties. Well, we're distracted and hating each other and being divided and blaming somebody else for the problems in this country and the problems in the world. Our freedoms of speech are slowly being eroded. We're seeing unprecedented levels of censorship. We're seeing government coercion with social media companies that are putting in. We're not even talking about just COVID. We're talking about 
a number of other things that are happening right now and people are being censored platforms are being removed we're seeing obviously the bill that i think it's still in congress right now maybe it might be to the senate i don't or maybe it even passed this week but it was the TikTok ban bill which gives the president of the united states authority to basically ban a social media app if you can ban one what's to stop them from banning anybody in the name of of what in, in the name of protecting us from hate speech right in the name of the common good national security national security absolutely but where does it end then and of course ultimately while we're being distracted and busy blaming one another or getting sucked into wars uh then the principles of this republic and this constitution are being eroded and lastly we know eventually we'll get to the the height of this tyranny will end in the union of church and state where the principles of the first amendment which again is talking about keeping the state and the church separated where those things will be undone and we will see the rise of, of this evangelical movement that is spurring this christian nationalist effort right now that is they're trying to address the problems which is a loss of morality and which we all agree we are definitely losing uh, a sense of morality and if if we don't have an educated and immoral people the founders were very clear on this in this country the democracy in this republic cannot stand so they're right to say there is a problem it's just the response is not the correct response the only way that these things can change it isn't through trying to legislate morality you can't do it that's like that's legalism that's what the pharisees what jesus was warning about right with the pharisees it's an old covenant approach absolutely and so the change has to come from a willing response to turn for us to turn back to god or to try to understand well what did make this nation great you know, why has this been such a blessed place uh, for so many people from so many backgrounds and so many religions? And is it actually a Christian principle to have religious liberty? Because with this movement that's rising now in this country, they say that this is a Christian nation and we need to have a national religion. Is that actually Christian? No. We're very confused. We don't know our history. You're right. It's not at all. And so these things have always been interesting to me and in my journey coming even coming into christianity coming to christ as and as it reminds me of a lot of what patrick was saying and a, a lot of us can relate with this i was trying to understand the world around me and i was trying to do that without god of course i grew up outside of any church my my dad was had a lutheran background my mom had a catholic background and they had attempted to raise my sister and i in a church but very quickly and very early on in my life, they just weren't satisfied with what they were seeing. I, I, had, I had one memory of like kind of doing the church shopping thing, but then that was really it. And so I was raised outside of the church and eventually chose to become an atheist and just follow evolution and follow what I was being taught in public school, essentially. And in the process, you know, I, I, I think God has placed this in every one of us. It's it's a sense of idealism, you know, like to aspire to something great, you know, something that should be or something better. And I had this strong sense of idealism and and I a strong sense of injustice is done and it's particularly as it relates to like our civil liberties and our freedoms that always it was just always interesting to me. And so when I was especially in my late teens and my early 20s, I was really focused on trying to understand like why don't we really have the liberty that this country was built upon why aren't we following the principles that were espoused by the framers of this country and i just was not happy with the levels of corruption and collusion between the state and corporations and and particularly where I, I began focusing was in the area of agriculture and with health and it was my attempt to try to start to make a difference in my early 20s that led me to start a business it's it's um it's interesting i this 
I, I decided to share some of this because uh, Sean was actually asking me, Sean Sutton, about like your my some of my background related to business because I I saw like I didn't want to just do the rat race thing and just work nine to five and and so I wanted to have more freedom in my life and have my own schedule but I didn't want to just make money for the sake of making money and at this time again early 20s I was not quite Christian yet uh, but I wanted so I wanted freedom but I wanted to make I, I wanted to try to address the corruption I was seeing I wanted to try to like what can we do to turn this thing around like I didn't know any of the truths in the Word of God I didn't have any prophecy to guide me I didn't have any way markers to know where we were in the stream of time so I focused on well we, we got to try we got to try to turn this thing around and just because we have what we have now this prophetic framework and we know that eventually there is going to be a movement that will culminate in repudiating all of the principles of this Constitution it doesn't mean that we just lay back and let it happen either Amen. but the these ultimate solution to any of this we know nationally it, it is going to happen but we have an opportunity to be a witness to those who don't know what we know to be able to help to identify the problem which is what it's a threat to liberty of conscience civil liberties and religious liberties and then to offer the solution what's the solution righteousness by faith this message this gospel all embodied in the character of god the identity message the divine pattern every day appointed times everything that we have this is the solution and that is what will bring again a reformation then individually which if enough people embrace those principles then this whole nation and the whole world can be warned to this it's impending threat to liberty so we do have a responsibility there and i'm going to talk more about that later in the week but the problem that i was having again early 20s starting to i mean i couldn't deny the fact that as i studied the history of this country the the founders some of which were christian some of which were deists i think maybe maybe a handful of them might have even been atheists but most of them but virtually all of them overwhelmingly they all saw value in principles of morality found in religion and especially in christianity but that doesn't mean we're a christian nation the separation of church and state is a christian principle how do we know what did jesus say render unto caesar's what is caesar's and render unto god what is god's the state does have a right to protect the civil liberties of its individuals to provide a place where there is stability where there's structure where we have safety and to allow us that freedom to then contribute to society right that's what has caused this country to flourish for as long as it has and at the same time what i didn't what i didn't have then was i didn't realize that I, how incongruent i was with what i really was really was promoting which was I, I was all about liberty it was all about freedom and what i didn't realize is that my personal life wasn't really a reflection of that at all i didn't see the connection between my character how i treated my friends my parents and just how i was governing my own life and what that had to do with the destiny of the nation or helping society but in this journey, I started to realize, like, I think I have to look at Christianity because the founders of this country are talking about it. They're talking about principles. I mean, we're talking about our Declaration of Independence. It, again, it gives and it identifies that we are beholden to a God who is our creator, that he has given us these rights, these inalienable rights to life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. And so I'm like, I can't ignore that because this is, this is a, really, these principles are... I mean, they're everything that give us the freedom and, and the enjoyment that we've had and the blessings that we've had have come through this. So I started to then become more interested in Christianity on that reason. And then where I started to recognize, wow, I'm a bit out of uh, incongruence. My, my personal life itself was, like, I started to recognize, like, oh, I'm really struggling. You know, I'm struggling to find peace. At this point, I'd started my business, by the way. And, and I said, I, I kind of began this journey with food and agriculture and health. I started a, a grass-fed organic beef jerky business. 
So this was kind of the beginning of the whole movement for where, you know, farmers were raising their, their cattle, their poultry in ways that how these animals have always been raised, which is out in the open where you have access to pasture, you have clean air, water, and they weren't pumping them full of a lot of things like hormones, growth hormones and vaccines, antibiotics, etc. So I've partnered with farmers like that and I would buy their animals from them and then obviously they would have to get slaughtered and then we would make through my family's business, I would contract them then to make uh, organic grass-fed beef jerky without any junk in it. So no chemicals, no preservatives, no GMOs. This is back like I think I launched it in 2011 to give you an idea of the time frame there. And now you can find this is much more, it's much why it's, it's much more readily available. I think even Walmarts now might even carry like grass fed beef. And so again, I, I wasn't, I didn't have this message yet. I, I wasn't aware of the, the blessing in being plant-based. I wasn't aware that that's how we originally had started. That's how God designed us. And it was only because of sin that things had changed. And again, the, the corruption, the perversion of, of our tastes and, so so i'm doing this and um in the process like you know i mean it, it, the business started to grow and i was able to have like have the lifestyle i wanted not not make a ton of money because you know, this is like three or so years into the business but i could cover my expenses and i had some freedom to travel and do things like that and, and i felt good about what i was doing because i could see that the industrialization of our food system was also destroying our health and that the government which is supposed to be able to give liberty to small producers and local farmers to give them freedom to raise you know the animals how they saw fit and to produce you know organic food i was also i started to get really into all aspects of farming uh, including all the produce and vegetables and fruit and i'm like why why is this so difficult like why why is there so much corruption going on and so I'm, I'm trying to figure all these things out and, and the business is growing, but I just realized like, I'm just not, I'm just not happy. And yeah, you know, I thought maybe by doing this, this would give me a sense of purpose and, you know, and just more of a sense of peace. And like, it just, I'm still struggling, still wrestling. And I, you know, trying to find my identity in doing something, being somebody, showing somebody I know something. And at that time too, I mean, I'm in my what, late or early twenties and I'd grown up in the world. And so I got into pornography and you know, masturbation and all these things as most young people do. And even in the church, like, I mean, I wouldn't say especially, but it's not much different. And, you know, we just don't have an answer for people because we don't, we haven't had the true gospel. We can't turn people to a true source of comfort because the source that we say is comforting us is also the source that if we don't submit to his son is going to burn us eternally or is going to condemn us is going to turn away from us when we don't keep the law perfectly so we're left in this perpetual state of terror and fear you can't get comfort if that same source is is also again threatening us and so there's just no answers and and so you know i'm having all these personal things which again the world celebrates these things well that's just who you are that's your sexuality you're young you do these things right but uh but it what i didn't realize is that that's an essential component of morality of freedom and of liberty ultimately is is these things are expressions ultimately of what it's it's not it's if we look at what sabrina just shared in those principles that i think the key is to a healthy marriage and a stable marriage it's that agape that self-sacrificing love is that that that's what is the bearing or the compass that guides the husband and wife and so when you're indulging in things like pornography and things that come with it it's, it's completely selfish right and that is going to do all kinds of things to the rest of our lives when it comes to impulsiveness and and just impatience and irritation and treating the opposite sex as a means to attain or use to get what you want rather than as we've hopefully have been learning with these principles as men learning especially as young men learning how to bless women bless your sisters bless your mothers learning how to respect your parents um, and take care of and treat women you know with dignity and respect 
the, the world and Satan through Hollywood, through the media, through all these things, he's obviously trying to destroy men so that, why? If you destroy the men, if you bind the strong man, then the house will fall. You won't have stable marriages. You won't be able to give that then to the children. And then what happens? Like the entire society or nation or faith community, or I mean, the principles are played out at all levels, but it will fall. And that's what we're experiencing. And we've, we have, I've shared in, in messages in the past, and Pastor Adrian has written about this in a number of his books, including Comforter, and also in, I think he's talked about in his newest manuscript that he's working on, the, the principles of purity in marriage, chastity, and what that has to do with the stability or the flourishing of a society. And there was a, a secular historian in the 1930s named J.D. Unwin, who was a historian or a social anthropologist for Oxford University. Again, he wasn't trying to promote religion at all, but he was trying to identify what keeps nations stable. And he looked at the relationship between prosperity in all fields of human knowledge and the connection to marriages. Like what, what are the society's views on marriage? Is marriage something that is, again, it's for based upon a relationship that is reflecting God and his son, which is eternal. Like, do, do we allow for uh, very flippant divorces, in other words? Do they do nations teach premarital chastity, waiting till, till you're married to have sex? What, what are these things, what's going on in these nations across history? And he studied, I believe it was like over 70 different nations across history, and the nations that had the greatest degrees of flourishing were the ones that had the, mo the, the highest degrees of chastity and that really elevated the purity of marriage and the importance of marriage and that divorce is not something that enters into the equation. That's what brought stability. But we miss that when we look at the problems. We say, oh yes, we see that this country is, is crumbling and we see that the West is falling apart and we need to, we need to get back to morality. But we just seem to miss the connection between marriages and the stability of the nation. And so I'm starting, again, wrestling with these things, wanting to change our country and having this business, but realizing I'm not happy, but then, and then also recognizing, well, the founders are really like the principles of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. I mean, they're, they're giving, again, they're saying that God has given us these rights and they're, they're believing in absolute truth. So I've got to investigate this stuff. And that's what ultimately those things, this combination of looking at the big picture of what made this country stable and the principles behind the Constitution, coupled with my own personal struggles that ultimately led me finally in my mid-20s to give my life to Christ. Amen. And it was in the beginning, though, it was an old covenant experience. And to this day, I still have old covenant wrestles. And, and I'm not going to elaborate on just some of the nuance of that. We've, we have other messages and studies that you can read for that. But it was God meeting me where I was at. Just as Patrick had shared yesterday, uh, he, you know, God met him through trying to understand conspiracy in this world. And it was similar with me. I wanted to understand why, why what is the force behind the destruction of this country? And, and then also eventually, like, I, I want to be a better person. I realized that I wasn't, I wasn't really as appreciative of my parents as I should have been. I wasn't as helpful around the house growing up as I should have been. I was so obsessed with sports. I was a sw competitive swimmer. I played a bit of soccer my, um, during high school, but it was mostly swimming. And then when I wasn't doing that, I was gaming uh, with my friends. And, and so it was just all about me. And my parents were very gracious and, and very patient with me. And I really, I'm really grateful. Uh, I've really been blessed. I've had, a, I've grown up in a stable home, but I just didn't appreciate that stability. And, and so, so yeah, it wasn't as helpful as I, as I could be. And, and I started to recognize that in my early twenties, you know, as I was then first starting to become a Christian that, you know, like I really, I've really missed out on a lot of opportunities I've had to appreciate, show my parents that I appreciate them and, and to be helpful to them and respect them. And, and even my friends too. I mean, just dealing with just being angry with people. Um, you know, just, I, I, rec I started to recognize, you know, God was showing me like, you're quite condemning. You're condemning of yourself and you're condemning of other people. First, I think he showed me probably, well, probably both really. 
and, and just getting irritated with people and and just so easily blaming other people for the problems in, in the world or, or when I make mistakes, just trying to get out of it and not actually take responsibility. So I, I recognized those things and it was only what? It's, it wasn't me. It's the grace of God. It was the Spirit of God speaking to me. It was starting to help me to see these connections and realize that if if there's ever a chance, and again, I, I wasn't even Adventist yet, but if there's ever a chance really for this country to embody the principles that was founded upon, like it really actually has to start with myself. And really, you can say getting my life in order, but that's such an old covenant framework without the true gospel, without the true message of righteousness by faith and the character of God. But again, God accommodates us and he meets us where we're at. And so that's that's kind of how that journey began and, and recognizing like, you know what, the, the some of the best things that I can do are just to learn to really be patient and accommodating of others and to try to try to really be kind, not not fake nice, but try to really be kind and like and, and what principles really to, I really started to think about like what principles are important in life and and how do I align and how do I align myself with that and and so I want to read you guys a quote here from the book Education and it's Education 57 the greatest want of the world is the want of men Men who will not be bought or sold. Men who in their inmost souls are true and honest. Men who do not fear to call sin by its right name. Men whose conscience is as true to duty as the needle to the pole. Men who will stand for the right though the heavens fall. We saw the condition of our nation during the pandemic. We, prior to that, we have had the vast majority of people in this country would have said, I'm absolutely a principled individual and I stand for principles of liberty and freedom of speech. But then the COVID hit and all of a sudden we saw that these principles that we profess to be able to 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 stand for and even some of you know like some of us like to have the audacity to say like i'll lay my life down for these principles we saw just how quickly we capitulated and we didn't stand for truth in love and we allowed all of these things to happen in our the constitution to be suspended and the bill of rights and to very easily find ourselves being coerced and manipulated and also then to to end up hating one another so quickly just overnight and it just it really showed it shows us it showed me that we have trouble it's impossible for us to embody what i just read we give it lip service we say that we'll stand for principle and that we'll be true to principle but in reality when things get really difficult and when we are faced with the loss of our jobs or potentially the loss of a certain position and status, the loss of our, our careers or the loss of friendships, what are people going to think of me if I stand for my convictions? It's probably just easier to just go along with this. Just, you know, I don't want to rock the boat. I don't want to offend anybody. Like we, so we just don't say anything. We stay silent. And this quote is talking about a caliber of human beings, men and women, that even in, in the face of losing everything, including even our own lives, that we will stand for the principles that we believe in. Though the heavens should fall, though a thousand should fall right by your side. And what's the ultimate principle that we should stand for like as I've thought about principles of truth and honesty and genuine kindness uh, integrity you know telling the truth obviously not lying all these things these are wonderful principles but hopefully the greatest principle and the only principle that will make possible this 
this kind of character in our lives is the principle that God's love is unfailing. That God is our Heavenly Father. That He's promised to provide for not just some of our needs, but all of our needs. That's the greatest principle, because if we stop short of that, at best, again, we have an experience where outwardly we're trying to do all the right things, and we're running around and, and telling people, like, yeah, here's the true principles, and, and honesty is important, and, you know, marital faithfulness is important, and we shouldn't be doing these things, and this thing is, you know, corrupting society, and we're very good at, at saying what we should be doing, but as I found out in this experience as God was leading me, I wasn't actually living up to what I was professing. You know, my life was inconsistent, and that was that source of, of instability. And so God has led me through this process eventually of seeing, like, I can't do any of these things myself. I can't make myself better. You know, I can't, you know, when I was in my early 20s and then becoming convicted that, you know, that pornography is degrading to women and it's degrading to me. It was like, well, I don't want to do these things. And, and um, I think in the beginning, I remember that being like kind of easy to give that up. But what was harder, of course, was again, like, I think because the children are away, I can, I can speak more frankly, but you know, masturbation was harder. And, and it was only as I came to understand the principles of this message and the principles of God's character that in the face of all of my sins and in the face of me professing or promising, you know, I'm not going to do this again, or I'm, I'm not going to be disrespectful to this person, or I'm not going to lie, or, you know, I'm not going to get angry and then failing. What finally turned the corner for a lot of things, but especially that in you know, issues with lust was realizing that in the moment of my failures, God's not condemning me, you know? That that revelation, that reality in, in the face of like feeling utterly worthless and feeling like I've tried and I've failed and I've tried and I've failed and I just I just can't do it and everybody else seems to be struggling with these things too and the world seems to be promoting it and it was just knowing that you know, God's actually not he's not condemning me. And recognizing though, well he's not condemning me, this breaks his heart. Like it, it grieves him, it makes him sad but that he's willing to bear that that pain and that grief because that's agape. That's what love does. Again, the Bible talks about in 1 Corinthians 13 that love hopes all things, it bears all things, believes all things, and endears all things. That's our Heavenly Father, right? He bears all things, he believes all things, he hopes all things, and he endears all things. And that character he has given to his Son. Right? He's received a better name by inheritance, character of his father. And as I came to understand that God is my source of comfort and that in my failures he's not condemning me, there's where the victory came. And no longer the battle of lust, uh, the battle of lust was won. It doesn't mean that we don't have temptations. But that means in the face of temptations... We know who to run to. We know how to find comfort. You know, as Sabrina had shared in the principles, when a spouse is failing one another, if a husband's failing his wife or the wife is failing the husband, you don't have to become discouraged. It doesn't mean that we don't feel, have feelings where it's like, oh man, like I'm tempted to be frustrated or I feel kind of sad, but we don't have to let that define us and deflate us and depress us because comfort and value and love they come from our Father through Jesus. Amen. That's what sustains us. And it's, it's that revelation of the goodness of God, recognizing His goodness in the face of my sinfulness. That's what it's led me to repentance and a change of my life and, and a recognition. Like It was the Spirit of God working in me to see how incongruent that I've been. And just over time, once the outward things... You know, that though, once I've gotten victory over those things, the deeper that I've gone into this message, the, the more that I've understood of 
the practical application of what it means for God to be love and that he doesn't condemn me and what that the cross, really bearing the cross looks like and recognizing the ever-present cross that God and his son have been suffering since the inception of sin, beginning with the rebellion in heaven and that it was only at the physical cross that humanity really woke up to the fact that we're on this slow suicide, this spiritual autoimmune condition. And it was the physical cross. That's what began this process in my life. As I saw that and recognized that I'm just not happy in my early 20s. And I'm struggling with these things. And I want to be a better person, but I can't seem to do it. And even though I've done some outward things that look good to people, and I have business and doing all this, I'm, I'm still feeling empty. And it was in then choosing to give my life to God and to Jesus that, that began this process, which and he met me where I was at. And it was still this struggling through trying, you know, to, to take things into my own hands and instead of learning how to rest in God. But the rest, the, I'm, the amount of rest that I've been experiencing has been increasing proportionate to my understanding of God. Does that, does that make sense? So the more that I've understood of him, the more I've studied this message on the character of God, and the more I've understood about identity, the more that I find that circumstances that used to crush me or demoralize me or depress me or make me really angry, it, it doesn't have to defeat me. It's like, okay, I feel, you know, I have these feelings where I'm tempted to be discouraged or I'm tempted to despair or... You know, that might lead me to do this or that, but God, you promised to supply all my needs. You know? And you don't condemn me. And my value isn't in what I do. I can fail a thousand times over. You don't love me any less. Hallelujah. And, and, and the more that I've come to experience that and to believe that, the more that, that peace, that uncircumstantial peace is there. It's like a, a taste, just a bit of a taste of what sustained Jesus through his earthly ministry and through the darkest hours of that time from Gethsemane onward. Because all of his circumstances showed him that it seems like everybody on this planet has basically abandoned me. All those who profess to be closest to me, they've just forsaken me. And even before that, when I asked them to watch and pray with me and wait out, they couldn't do it. They were too terrified. They just wanted to go to sleep and forget it all. Like We've all had experiences. We've, we have it probably far more than we realize or are willing to admit where we feel abandoned by our friends, our family, our loved ones. So imagine Jesus feeling that and then having Satan pressing upon him that the sacrifice isn't good enough. That your father won't accept you. Right? That it's over. Like you, just trying to comprehend a little bit of this, it shows us again that the caliber of his love and his trust in his Father, and that's why that's the only way that we can actually keep the commandments of God and have this true experience where we can have the caliber of character, where our sense of duty and our conscience is as true as the needle is to the pole. The only way that it happens is through the faith of Jesus. And his faith was in his Father. He could have delivered himself from that at any point. Satan tried to tempt him at the very beginning of his ministry after he was baptized. Prove it. Prove that you're the Son of God. Deliver yourself. Display power. Right? The Pharisees and the Sadducees heckling him. If he's really the Son of God, come down from the cross. Of course he could have done it. But he chose to trust in his father and ultimately his victory which is our victory is that before he gave up that last breath of life as he said he said into your hands I commend my spirit father in spite of his circumstances in spite of what he was feeling utterly abandoned and forsaken by his disciples and by the world and feeling even as though his father had forsaken him. That wasn't the reality. There's a difference between feelings and reality. He chose to believe the word of God. He chose to believe 
that he was his father's son in whom his father delights. That's our hope and that's our victory. And as we really recognize that as we go to God, just as Jesus went to his father for comfort, then these challenges that so often beset us, we start to recognize that, wow, like God is helping me. Like he's really there for me. He's really supplying all my needs. Like I don't have to let my feelings overwhelm me right now. Just because I feel this way doesn't mean that I, I have to act on them. Like that's the key, the, the difference between feelings and faith. There's a quote, and maybe this is where I'll, I'll leave it. Uh, there's a, I don't know where the quote has come from, but there's a, an Adventist historian who I've been looking at recently to do some of uh, the preparation for the message that I'm going to give on, I think it's, it'll be the second message later, toward the end of the feast. He was looking at uh, the subject of liberty of conscience and what role the Adventist church played in warning the world about the threats to this. And he came across a quote related to liberty and freedom. And in a lot of ways, they could be the same thing. But with this, this definition, this quote, I really liked it. It made a, dis, a, a really key distinction. And it, and it goes as follows. Liberty is having the right to choose. Thus, liberty of conscience, right? Liberty means that I can choose, you know, to respond to God. And I can choose to live my life how I want to, so long as I'm not hurting other people. That's Those are the principles of this country, right? But freedom, the difference between that, so liberty being the right to choose, freedom is the result of making the right choice. Even if it's just mentally, even if you are in, in, in a prison cell, mentally you can be free by a choice of your will. Absolutely. Did you say the freedom one again? Yes. Freedom is the result of making the right choice. What, what I believe God has desired for this country is that this would be a place where we can truly have that liberty, that opportunity to choose for ourselves without coercion, without threats, without things being imposed upon us, without people telling us what we have to do and what we have to think. That's what has made this country extraordinary. And then with that freedom, I mean, excuse me, with that liberty, freedom is found in using that liberty to make the right choice. And how do we truly gain freedom? It's to choose to give, truly give our lives to our Heavenly Father. And to truly, as his son submitted to him and trusted him in everything, is to have that spirit working in our hearts. That's how we gain freedom. And so how, the work that I see before us is to experience this for ourselves. So to gain, to use that liberty that God has given us to make the right choice. To choose to believe that he's just like his son. That he truly doesn't condemn us. That there is no sin too great that he won't forgive unless we believe that he can't forgive it. Because he won't force his will upon us. He's created us to be completely free or to have that liberty. And he presents to us day in and day out with opportunity after opportunity to make the right choice. And that's to gain freedom. And that choice comes by choosing him. And choosing to really get to know him, to search for him with all of our hearts. And then the Bible says in Jeremiah, then we'll find him. So I pray that my story is a blessing and that we can see uh, the connection between our own experiences and the experience of our faith communities, our families, uh, our nation. And that the nation is only a reflection of the people that, that live in that nation. And that as we gain these victories over selfishness, that in turn, this gives permission to others to do the same, to believe that, wow, if, if 
that can happen with him, I've really seen a transformation. Like maybe that can happen for me too. Like maybe maybe I'll reconsider what I thought about God. Maybe I can give this a chance. And and in process, we can then take this freedom that we're gaining in God by better understanding Him, and we can use that then to warn the world as to this impending crisis, this crisis to liberty of conscience, because we want people to have the freedom, or the, I should say the liberty to make the right choice and to be able to gain that freedom. Because when enough people have done that, when, when everybody has made those decisions, and only then will Jesus be able to return. And so he is waiting, as it says, I believe that's in Christ's Object Lessons, he's waiting with longing desire for his character to be manifested in the lives of his people, in our lives, then he will come to claim us as his own. Yeah, I like the word you said, the truth. For today, I choose to serve the Lord. And for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. Absolutely. And again, serving God, like choosing Him, it, it means being willing to allow God to show us things that, that might be uncomfortable. To be, and to be willing then to confront things that before we couldn't because we didn't trust God. And we didn't understand the insidiousness of sin and the deceitfulness of our hearts. So that we recognize, oh, well, this thing is coming before me now, but if God's not actually doing that to condemn me and rub my face in it. No, he's, he's doing it to show me that I need his help. And that where my sin abounds, grace does much more abound. That's, that's the whole point. And so if any of us have been having these experiences during or lead up to this feast, praise God, we can receive the grace that abounds much more at this time. Because he knows what we need. And he's so willing to give it to us. And so let's pray to close and, and ask him for all of our needs. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you for creating us as free beings. You've given us that liberty to make decisions for ourselves, to think for ourselves. And with that freedom, with that liberty, we know that there's a, a tremendous risk. There's a risk that you might never see us again if we choose to turn away from you. And Father, most of my life, I had made that choice. I wasn't interested. I didn't even believe in you during my teen years into my early 20s. And then Father, once I began to pursue your son and you and accepted that you're real and that Jesus died on the cross for me, I still didn't have it right, Father. I totally misunderstood you. I'm still struggling in my life. And through all this process, it's caused you tremendous suffering, but yet you and your son have willingly done this, and even joyfully so, because you love me. You love each and every one of us, Father. And you're willing to bear that cross, that cross, that 6,000-year cross, and that I pray that as we appreciate this liberty that you've given to us, that you aren't forcing us, you're not a dictator, that you're not telling us exactly what we have to do, even though sometimes we say, you know, if you could just make it easy for me and tell me what I need to do, our carnal hearts would rebel against that, Father. You're too wise to err and too good to do us harm. And it's this goodness, I pray that through my testimony, Father, that we could taste and have more hope and to know that all things are possible through Christ. There isn't any sin that besets us, any challenge any imperfection and defect that can't be cleansed by your love, Father. I pray that your love has shined forth through this time and that we could go away encouraged and that iron is sharpening iron and so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. And I thank you for hearing this prayer and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Thank you. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. Love you too.